Today, we have the candidates for Brattleboro's District 3 House seat, the Democratic primary on Tuesday, and we would invite you to give us your question online on our Facebook site, 96.7 WTSA-FM. And with that, we would like to introduce the candidates to my, this is my left hand, my left is Kate O'Connor, to my right, Tristan Tolino. Both of you, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Now, before we went on the air, we flipped a coin, and Kate, you won the toss, so you get to respond to the first question first. And I won't put time limits on these questions or answers unless they really get out of hand. Variety of you. Okay, so firstly, your chance to tell us who you are and why you decided to run for this position. Sure. Um, first, Tim, I want to thank you guys for doing this because I think it's a good public service to have people able to meet both Tristan and I. Um, so who I am. Um, I was born and raised here in Brattleboro. Um, my family has been here for a very, very long time. I went to Brattleboro Union High School, um, graduated, and then I went off to college in Maine where I got a degree in political science. Um, I've had the opportunity to work in state government um, as well as actually I've worked for three governors, Madeline Kunin, Howard Dean, and Peter Shumlin. Um, I worked for 11 and a half years in the governor's office as a, an aide and a, a member of Governor Dean's cabinet, which I you know, think gives me a really good working knowledge of um, how the state works. Why I'm running is I, there's so much good things I think we can do on the state level to help Brattleboro. We're a wonderful commu community here. We've got a lot of um, very active citizens. Um, we've got, I think, a really great town staff. And you know, we're a town right now that um, is sort of <coughs> facing some economic st um, stability issues. Um, and a lot of people are addressing that. We have a um, our population is aging, our um, wages are lower, and I think there's a lot we can do at the state level and um, to help. There's a really good group of people working on it now, and I'd like to do what I can on the state level to help them. So, you know, that's really why I'm running. I love this town. I want to do whatever I can um, to help us grow and prosper. Tristan Tolino, could you respond sure. to that question, please? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, thank you as well. I really appreciate you doing this. Uh, I think it's great for the town. Um, well, I grew up in Marlboro, so uh, I was there through eighth grade and then came down to Brattleboro Union High School. So we have two Brattleboro uh, UHS alums running. Uh, and then uh, I, I left for college. I studied philosophy as an undergraduate, then decided I wanted to be a chef. So I got an associate's degree uh, in culinary arts at, up in Burlington area. Uh, and then moved to New York City for a few years, worked there, and then in 1999 uh, came back to Brattleboro. Uh, like a lot of young people, I, I came back thinking with my wife, who's from Brattleboro as well, uh, how do we get back to Vermont, uh, you know, and when are we going to get back to Vermont? And, and it, as it happened um, that summer, uh, my um, in-laws uh, purchased the Riverview Cafe, and I became the operating partner uh, at the restaurant for 11 years until it closed in 2010. Uh, I then uh, started a catering business and along the way over the last few years I also got an MBA uh, in managing for sustainability uh, business degree looking at thinking about what kind of business can can happen in this community what are we where are we going how do we get there uh, how does that connect to sort of our Vermont working landscape tradition and the values that we have as a state. Uh, why I'm running I think is an extension of what I've been doing in the community over the last 13 years uh, since I moved back. And it's working in schools, it's working um, on local food systems issues, it's thinking about the future of business, it's running a business and employing a, a number of people. You know, over the decade that the restaurant was open, I had over 400 employees over that time period, and I, I got to know. Actually, it started to get to the point where I'm starting to feel like, oh my god, I'm getting older. Because uh, I started to have kids of high school classmates working for me. That was an, an interesting transition for me. But you know, many, many different aspects of, of running a business and having employees and dealing with their, you know, the issues that they face in the community started to get even more active than I had been. And I, and I feel that 
this is an opportunity for me uh, to take what I've seen in the community over the decade plus and focus on, on state solutions, policy solutions that can be implemented that will affect Brattleboro in a great way. Well, thank you. Um, expounding upon that, both of you had mentioned the business community, and I want to uh, address this first to Kristen. Mm -hmm. uh, what, from your business experience, would be beneficial in Montpelier? Two things, I think. Uh, you know, one is uh, I have a sense of um, sort of the financial challenges that businesses face in this community, and um, and and uh, and I also went to school in order to really sharpen my business skills and try to understand how to be a more effective business person and what the, the sort of the big picture issues are for business uh, writ large. Uh, and, but secondarily, and I think this is really what I was saying earlier about having lots of employees here. You know, every business in this community has to address the challenges of staffing, you know, with excellent people, finding a really good fit in the community for their business goals and figuring out how to grow. And I've talked to a couple of, you know, local business leaders in SIT, the CFO of SIT and Bradford Machines. You know, those are two, two strong local business enterprises, SIT, we don't think of it as a business, but it's essentially the same, same dynamic, uh, you know, who when they've had some excellent jobs open up, have had a hard time finding qualified people. So we have two problems in the town. We have a problem of not enough jobs overall, and we also have a problem of not a right fit in every, in every situation. So where we have a business that's thriving, that we're trying to get uh, you know, an opportunity to grow, they don't always have the, the right fit to find the right employees. So those are two different policy challenges. How do we address the needs of people who don't have work, where there's not enough sort of entry level positions for young people, uh, especially people who have uh, lower skills coming out of high school or perhaps dropping out? And then how do we match you know, strong businesses that are already growing and, and needing qualified workers with the skill set that they need? And I guess I would ask you the same thing, Kate. What, from your own business experience, would you take with you, and how would that influence what you do for business in Montpelier? Sure. I'm a um, member of Building a Better Brattleboro in the Brattleboro Development Credit Corporation. And on those two uh, committees, obviously, they deal with business, and they are um, sort of uh, speak on behalf of businesses on what the challenges are of being a business in in Brattleboro. Um, both organizations also are trying to get new businesses to come into um, the town, and not only the town, but it's also the county, because you can't just work in isolation, Brattleboro can't work in isolation. And what, you know, I've heard from those, those working on those groups, as well as talking to business people, um, again, in Brattleboro and around the community, um, part of what they need, and Tristan pointed this out, is you need workers who are trained you know, to do the jobs that are necessary. And we obviously need more jobs in the community. Part of that has to do with um, health care. It's very expensive if you're a small business to provide um, benefits to your employees. It also has to do a lot about broadband and you know wireless and cell service. It, you know, if we don't, it's, that's what you need nowadays. Um, I'm also on a committee on the state level. It's called the Community Development Block Grant Board. And what we do is we look at um, projects, whether they're housing projects or um, economic development projects that um, help low to moderate income people. And through that, what I've found is that there really are a lot of interesting um, companies that come into our state that I think a lot of people don't know about. But it, it shows me that there's really a potential. There's a Vermont brand here that um, it, we, you know, if we sell ourselves right, it's a, it makes it an attractive place. Again, Brattleboro, Wyndham County, and Vermont to do business in. You're listening to a live Meet the Candidate event with the two Democratic candidates for the Brattleboro District 3 House seat. They both are on the ballot in next Tuesday's primary. We'll come back and continue our conversation with Tristan Tolino and Kate O'Connor. This is Tim Johnson. We're back next. Uh, and we also invite you to email in your questions via our Facebook page, 96.7 WTSA-FM. In fact, we have a, a question that has uh, been sent in this morning, and, and really the question being, uh, this comes from Pickles, by the way. 
<laughs> How effective can a freshman legislator be in Montpelier as far as learning curves, committee assignments, and the like? And in turn, Kate gets this one first. I think, um, I know I can only speak for myself, um, what I can bring as a fresh, freshman legislator. I, as I said before, I worked for um, Howard Dean for 11 and a half years. Um, I've spent an inordinate of time in the State House watching the legislative process, um, not only from the administrative executive branch level, but when you work closely with the legislature and legislators, you understand you know, the, what that process is. So I think I can get there and um, really start running. I have um, relationships with a lot of people that are already there from the Speaker of the House on the legislative side. I know a lot of the legislators, again, some of them have been there um, when I was there in the governor's office. Um, I was also endorsed by the governor, so I, you know, I have a working relationship with him. And you know, again, you know, again, I think it really comes down to I understand what the process is like. And what I say to people is I not only know what works in the process, but more importantly, I think sometimes it's knowing what doesn't work. So you can maneuver around that. And you know, I think that I, I bring those skills to the legislature if I was elected. Tristan. Sure. Well, uh, I will actually point to my father-in-law, uh, Don Webster, as, a, as an example of what you can, how, how to answer that question, because he went up to Montpelier, uh, well, I guess 12 years ago now, to serve this district, uh, and he did uh, a two-year term, and he was quite effective. Uh, he worked really very closely uh, and was sort of the lead person on, on a major piece of legislation to support downtowns. And uh, I think that the, the question really comes down to the individual capacity uh, to absorb the process issues um, and then to figure out very quickly, you know, where can you have an impact. And some of that will depend on committee assignments. Neither one of us is in control of where we end up on a committee. Uh, whether that committee aligns with, with something that, that is an important issue, salient issue at that moment in the legislature. Um, you know, but my example of, excuse me, my example of my father-in-law is one where I would say that quite clearly, you know, it, it depends on the person because some people have tremendous impact in a very short period of time. We're getting some excellent questions online, again, via Facebook. And that address is 96.7 WTSA-FM. This question comes from AJ. And he asks that, what would you as a legislator do to keep state spending under control and provide some greater transparency for uh, Vermonters to see where their tax dollars go? Tristan, this is yours first. Sure. Well, I think one of the nice things about Vermont is that we have had uh, a very a strong legislature for a long time that has had an emphasis on balancing the budget and focusing on, on fiscal responsibility and clarity. I, I think that there's always room for improvement. Um, there are some areas probably in the tax code that could be simplified a little bit uh, in particular. But in, in what I think that uh, the real question for me as somebody representing the Brattleboro area is, you know, how, to, how would I propose to be clear with my constituents about what I see as the issues and where there are opportunities to improve. And, and I really have a vision for a, a, a process of strong two-way communication with the community uh, through my website, which has you know, interactive blogs, and through Facebook and modern uh, you know, sort of social media opportunities. And I think also getting, you know, really being part of the community over the last decade and, and building those relationships and you know, in Rotary, I know people will, will also interact with me. And I think it's about communication uh, as much as it is about the end result, because right now, you know, the state has shown, uh, even in the face of the Irene um, budget busting challenges, that it had a commitment to doing everything it could to keep the costs down. Kate. Um, I actually agree with um, what Tristan just said. I think we are fortunate in this state to have um, a legislature um, and a governor, and we've had this for a really, really long time now, that have been committed to fiscal responsibility. And you know that obviously is the best way to keep the budget under control. And I also think that we're really lucky in this state that we are a citizen legislature, um, that people really have access to not really not only their legislators, um, but the governor, 
And um, so, you know, people can get their questions answered. Um, there's not a really big bureaucracy to go through, which I, I do think is helpful both on the people offering suggestions on what they believe in, whether it's the budget or, you know, any other issue, but it's also the legislators being able to um, communicate with their constituents. This weekend marks really the start of the uh, one-year anniversary of Tropical Storm Irene to hit Southern Vermont. And Brattleboro was among the uh, communities hit really hard by the, uh, by the tropical storm. So I guess I'd start with, with you this time, Kate. Um, what have people that you've been speaking with out campaigning told you about what the current needs are in the wake of the storm, and how would you as a legislator help get, make that happen? Sure. Um, one of the interesting things um, that's, first of all, I want to say that how the local officials and state officials handled the storm itself in the aftermath, I think we all need to congratulate them for. Um, again, I mentioned that I was on the Community Development Block Grant Board, and it was, it's going to be our board that decides what projects um, are funded through the federal government. We're getting about 20 million plus dollars, maybe it's even 29 million, from the federal government. And what's been really interesting, um, see, you know, because there's, and there's a limited amount of money, obviously. And recently, the um, state officials came down to Brattleboro and really, and talked about the process and how much money we had. And at that meeting, there were quite a few business owners from, from Brattleboro, particularly on uh, Flat Street, who have been really impacted. And with, you know, a lot of them don't need a lot of money. They just need a little money to get themselves back up. And I think it's going to be, I wish that we could do everything that everybody wanted. Unfortunately, there are limited resources. And it's, you know, it's going to be hard to decide, but, you know, sometimes it's just a little bit. And I know that um, Peter Welch was helping on the federal level, trying to make it possible for um, the Small Business Administration to get loans to uh, some of the businesses easier. You know, it's, it's it particularly the business community, I think, needs a lot, a lot of help. And it's really hard. We wish we would, there were more resources, but I think a lot of hard decisions are going to have to be made coming up. Tristan. Well, it's interesting that this comes on the heels of the of the budget question because this is an area where I think we actually have to stretch more, and um, and we you know whether I, and I'm you know not sure whether the emergency fund is an applicable choice here or or how we do it. But uh, Kate's absolutely right. The impact on the business community has been profound, and there's two things I want to say about that. One is that many people assume that, that the federal system of support that kicked in for homeowners is similar for businesses and that's not true. So if you were a business that was operating without much uh, debt and then had to um, rebuild your business or your building, uh, the way that you were allowed to do that with the federal support was through low interest loans. But you've gone from a debt free business to a highly leveraged business, a high, you know, a high debt business. Even if the interest rate is relatively good, um, it's a fundamental difference in your operating flexibility, your ability to add employees, all kinds of things. And then the second reason I think we have to do it is because uh, this is one of those situations where when, um, when the business community, when the, the economy shrinks, whether it's from a lack of demand or from a crisis, uh, the faster we get it back, the better the long-term revenue stream is for the state. And in this area, that means if we invest $5 million, you know, we're probably going to see more than that in return in terms of jobs, taxes, the whole sort of social network that, that comes with a strong economy return to us in 10 years or 15 years. If we wait 10 or 15 years down the road, we might just be getting back to our baseline. And so it's an investment. Um, it's, it's basically the same as the challenge that we faced when the economy uh, at the federal level, you know, state and national level, um, went into such a, a steep decline three years ago. Now, Tristan, you have been fairly high profile in the, uh, the local food uh, mm -hmm. movement. Some of the things that uh, the uh, Shellman administration has been pushing as a way to create jobs. What can you tell me about what you've uh, learned in that experience and what some of those experiences could mean in, in the form of policy if you were a legislator. Sure. 
Well, first off, I want to. I'm very grateful that the governor and the legislature over the last few years have gotten more in touch with this issue. Um, I, I'll say this: I think this is a good example of, of something that I have been saying throughout this campaign season about sort of grassroots energy, and that is that you know the grassroots in Vermont is what created the opportunity for the governor and the legislature uh, to, to step into the local food movement. It was it was consumers, it was chefs, it was farmers making a commitment over the last couple of decades to grow our own food, to produce high quality, value added foods, uh, to make a commitment to buying from each other and building relationships. And that is the core of what has happened is that people have built relationships with each other as you know, business to business, consumer to business, uh, and, and created an opportunity for the legislature to step in. That said, um, the amount of money that they've allocated uh, is, is important, but it's just the beginning of seed money. And we really have to figure out how to expand the local food movement more into the supermarket space uh, in particular. Uh, that's a huge part of the market. We're barely touching it. Uh, local food co-ops are very strong. Uh, CSAs are very strong, that sort of thing. And Kate, from your standpoint, how important is the local food movement and agriculture in Vermont? And how would you protect and expand that if you were legislating? Sure, I think it's very important. You know, I think sometimes we forget that we have an agricultural um, background in this in this state. Um, with the, as Tristan was saying, the legislature just passed the um, Working Lands um, Enterprise Bill, which did put money um, to help um, farms and agriculture in the state. And I think that was a really good um, bill for um, the legislature and the governor to work on. Um, there, what's interesting, you know, we have the um, Farm to Plate um, uh, uh, initiative in this state. And um, we also have, you know, I can expand a little bit more. We, um, the Vermont brand is important to a lot of people, not only in Vermont, but outside of Vermont. And I think that that's a really big opportunity that we have um, to market our products, whether it's cheese, yogurt. Um, there's a company up um, here that's just started in Vermont, or Brattleboro, called Carbon Harvest. And they're going to be um, making, selling, growing basil and selling it um, to uh, food co-ops. So it's, you know, I think it's, there are interesting things that go beyond what the traditional agriculture um, it can be in our in our county in our state. Can I comment on, on one thing? And it's not to disagree with Kate. It's just to you know that as an example, that working landscapes I mean working enterprise uh, allocation I think was 1.1 million. Uh, a few years ago, the state gave about a 600 thousand dollar grant to a slaughter facility to get open. Um, before it even opened, there was still pressure throughout the state. And so, if you think about in terms of capacity and, de and you know, the demand was, was bigger than the, the production capacity of the slaughter facilities. So if, if you think about that in terms of the amount of money that we we're spending, we're not spending enough to really energize what's out there and, and it's an important part of our business strategy as a state. Uh, it's important to preserve our uh, image as a working landscape state. So I think we're in agreement on that. I just wanted to add that one piece. You're listening to a special Meet the Candidates event with Brattleboro District 3 Democratic House candidates Kate O'Connor and Tristan Tolino. This is Tim Johnson, and we invite you to uh, email in your questions via Facebook at 96.7 WTSA-FM. We'll come back next on 96.7 TSA-FM. Welcome back to a special Meet the Candidates event on 96.7 TSA-FM. Good morning, this is Tim Johnson. We're pleased to have with us the two candidates for the Brattleboro District 3 House seat in the upcoming Democratic primary on Tuesday, Tristan Tolino and Kate O'Connor. Good morning. Good morning again. Uh, we also are inviting questions via Facebook and our Facebook page, 96.7 WTSAFM. Got to ask you about health care because uh, many Vermonters have told me that some of the upcoming changes are either about time or frankly scare the bejesus out of them. So, which direction should we be heading on in providing health care for Vermonters, and how would you affect that change if you were in Montpelier? And Kate, you get the lead on this first one. Sure. I actually think um, I support the Green Mountain Care Bill that the um, governor and the legislature passed and are still working on. 
Um, I too have talked to a lot of people, you know, small business owners who, again, you know, need um, a way to provide health care benefits to their employees. I also like the idea of Green Mountain Care, and this is a big thing for the governor, to make it so the health insurance um, travels with the person as opposed to stays with the business. You know, so it makes it so you don't have to work for a business that gets health insurance to get it. Um, I also know that it is scary for people when some, you know, you have your health insurance, you know what it's like, you know what your premium is, um, you know what your co-pays are, and all of a sudden it's going to change. And that is very, very scary. You know, I'm a person that um, buys my own health insurance, and I know I'm like, oh goodness, you know, I know what I, I know what I'm getting, I know what I'm paying. So I really understand that fear that people have, but I really do think um, everybody should be able to have access to health insurance. Um, and I think it's really important. I support it. We need to make sure that we can fund it. And I know the governor has said when the Green Mountain Care Board, they're going to come out with the funding mechanisms, how much they think it should cost. And he's been very, very clear that um, if it's not affordable, you know, he's not going to push it that way. And we're going to have to figure out, you know, different ways to do it. But I think there's been a really good, strong commitment from the executive branch and the legislature to make sure that in some way, shape, or form, um, everybody in the state has access to health care. And I think it's the, totally the right way to go. Christian. Yeah, uh, actually, I, I totally agree uh, with the, the point that we need to get Green Mountain Care throughout the state, that we need to move in that direction. Um, I'm very sympathetic to people who are afraid uh, about the implications of that, because what we've done is we've set, as a state, we've set a roadmap uh, for a, a two-year process, maybe more, of trying to move in, in the right direction, but also figure out how to pay for it and how to fit it in with a complex and changing uh, federal environment. And that's not necessarily, um, has not always been clear what the politics at the federal level are doing to the funding mechanisms at the state level. What I do want to say is that uh, I've come from an industry 18 years in an industry uh, that is known for not having health insurance. This is, you know, the restaurant industry uh, is, is one where uh, frankly, we, we work in pretty harsh environments. People uh, often uh, you know, sort of live hard in, in the restaurant industry um, and are usually uh, fairly low paid and, and uninsured. And so for me, it's actually quite personal. Uh, I know a lot of people who I helped when, we were, when I had the restaurant uh, that I could, we couldn't afford to offer health insurance to our employees, but I, I would help them fill out the paperwork and try to figure out how to get them into uh, these alternative paths, and and one person in particular is very close to me, uh, who has you know some mental health needs, some medication. And that's nine thousand dollars a year that it would cost him out of pocket, and you know for a person who's in the restaurant industry, nine thousand dollars a year would put him you know in dire poverty if he had to carry that all by himself. And and the mental health needs of the state are so so important. And I do thank uh, Governor Shumlin for his leadership on this. I think he's shown a commitment to mental health as part of the overall uh, care you know, needs of our state. So there's a lot of different things at play here. I think the next couple of years in the legislature are going to be really, really important. Uh, and the only way that I could answer the fear component is to say that we're going to have to work together and we're going to have to communicate really clearly about what the trade-offs are and how we can support businesses as they transition into a new system. And let me say that I try not to argue with people who handle knives for a living. <laughs> yeah. The 800-pound gorilla in the room for Wyndham County, it has been uh, since I was a child, is what is our current energy mix? What should our future energy mix be? Tristan, your take on that, particularly with uh, the fact that Energy Vermont Yankee is right to the south of your district. Sure. Well, uh, I do think that it's time for VY to close, um, and uh, I say that with a heavy heart because I know um, great people who work there and have a real commitment to making that facility a safe and productive facility. Uh, I think the issues are, um, frankly, larger than Brattleboro and are structural in our energy policy system, in our long-term waste solutions, uh, and in the economics of energy. And so uh, it's... It's one of those things where, where the impact on us is, is some sort of disproportionate to our ability to control it. Uh, I, I favor, obviously, a move towards a more sustainable energy policy, more sustainable green energy, uh, distributed energy, meaning that you, know, you, you try to create 
smaller amounts of energy throughout the state rather than very, very large municipal sized projects uh, that are capital intensive and also um, can kind of move out of state. Because one of the great benefits of a distributed energy system is that there are jobs that are anchored there for the long term. Uh, so, you know, I think that all in all it fits with where Vermont needs to go. It fits with the pressures on climate change and, and how we're going to get there as, as a country and as a world. Uh, and, and it also fits with the constraints that are in place on, on uh, the nuclear industry in, in terms of uh, its viability in business model and also the, the long-term waste issues. Kate O'Connor. Sure. I um, actually agree on a lot of what Tristan just said. And I, too, believe that um, Vermont Yankee needs to close. And I, too, say it with um, a heavy heart because my own brother-in-law works there. Um, obviously, that's an issue that we really disagree on, so we don't talk about it at Thanksgiving. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that's a great thing to do. Um, one of the things I would add um, about what Tristan said, you know, I am also a proponent of sustainable energy, green energy. And it's hard, I think, to balance what we all want with the reality of what we can do. And you know, we have a lot of issues on trying to decide um, what people think about wind power in the state. Um, there was an issue up in the Grafton, New Fane area about um, a wind turbine. There's also, you know, I think a lot of people have seen on the news the problems that they're having in Lowell. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we have to figure it out um, in a way that you know, it's sort of bigger than what we think. We all like wind power, we all say we want it, but then when it you know, comes in your own backyard, you're like, I don't want to see that wind turbine. So I really think there's some issues that we have to grapple with on how we get to where we want to get, you know, and, and as a state. Um, but I really do think we have to get there. Can I comment on that? I, uh, a few years ago, the state legislature uh, passed a legislation called the SPEED program, and, and the design of that was to try to uh, move the, the growth and need in, in, in energy production, uh, electric energy production, uh, into renewables. And they offered 50 megawatts, uh, I think, total capacity in the speed program of a feed-in tariff system, which means it was guaranteed certain price points for a certain amount of energy. That's boring. The important part is that um, it, it was very small-scale projects uh, that were done, you know, for individuals, businesses, homeowners to try to, to tap into this program and get some support uh, on the capital investment. The very first day that bids were due, it was oversubscribed by five times what the legislature had set up for it. So, you know, we have a disconnect between, you know, what we want to do within the policy apparatus, what we can figure out how to finance successfully, what fits with the large energy companies in the state, as Metro, which owns CBPS and, and Green Mountain Power now, you know, and how they want their energy mix to go, and then what Vermonters who are looking for some state and federal support to make changes want. And so we have to work extra hard, I think, over the next few years to figure out how to bridge those gaps. Could follow up with the question of what does the term not in my backyard mean to you as it relates to this energy debate? Because really, whether it's a nuclear power plant, whether it's a wind turbine, whether it's a uh, uh, biomass plant, a lot of things get people riled up. Um, Tristan, how would you respond? Well, I, again, so I think that you have to look at two things. You have to look at the fact that people are where they are um, initially. You know, they're going to be, there are going to be people who are going to be upset about something and, and not in my backyard is, is going to be a, a defining uh, perspective for them. Uh, but you don't get people to move if you're not honest and direct and uh, respectful and work really hard at the, at the communication. And, and what we need is for a majority of people on any given issue to be able to step outside of their own particular you know, small perspective of you know, local perspective, perhaps or micro local perspective, and see what the big issue here is. And that's true for wind power. Um, you know, if we get a lot of power from from uh, Hydro Quebec, well, the transition for Hydro Quebec to be producing that much power 30 years ago or 40 years ago, whenever it happened, obviously had a huge impact on communities in, in Quebec. Totally isolated from us, not part of our decision making about whether wind power is good or bad. And, and so we have to work 
on sharing those stories about how every decision that we make or don't make has an impact on somebody else and try to say what's the best sort of higher level perspective that we can apply here and, and look for consensus and it's, it's hard work. Kate? Okay. Yeah, I actually agree with Tristan. I just have like um, a little interesting story. Um, um, I was talking to Howard Dean recently and he has land in Lowell that's mm -hmm. right across from where they're putting you know, the wind turbine. And what was funny about the whole thing is here's a guy that's always that's been a proponent of clean energy, sustainable energy, and all of a sudden, you know, this wind tower is going to go in across um, from li the land he owns. He'd look at it. But he said, you know, you can't say you're for something that's good to everybody and then say, Ooh, you know, not right where I am. So he's come to the, you know, he says, I can't be, it's not your, I don't want to use the word hypocrite, but you have to like look like, how can I be for this, but then be against it? So I think it's a struggle that we all have, and he's really come to the thought, I got to support this because I got to sort of practice what you preach kind of thing. And just a very funny kind of, since we've been um, in, in our little uh, race here has all these different players. Um, my uh, mother-in-law's brother owns property almost across the street from Howard's and is on the other side of the issue. Yeah. Um, it just kind of, you know, this this is one of those, this is a small state uh, moment uh, where, you know, we, every issue affects all of us. You're listening to a special Meet Your Candidates event on 96.7 TSAFM. Again, thank you for joining us. This is Tim Johnson on 96.7 TSAFM, and we have a special Get to Know Your Candidates event this morning on the air with Tristan Tolino and Kate O'Connor, the two Democratic candidates for Brattleboro's District 3 House seat. Now, in this, in this last segment, I wanted to get to some of the things that really have uh, kind of spilled over and, and made this... Uh, race a little bit more watched than some, but I want to do it in a way that it really uh, doesn't get anybody angry, because quite frankly, once the ballot boxes are closed, you two have got to work with each other, we've all got to work with each other in this community. Uh, we all make decisions, and we think they're the right ones at the time, but I want, Kate, if you could give us a chance to uh, go back through the fact that uh, you've had a chance to work for some people who might not have been card-carrying Democratic Party members. Sure. Um, I think um, you're speaking about when I worked um, for Rich Tarrant in 2006, who was a U.S. Senate candidate. Um, you know, I have been, always have been a Democrat, always will be a Democrat. And Rich hired me because I was a Democrat. And I knew Rich Tarrant prior to him becoming a candidate for the United States Senate. I don't know how many people remember, but he was the founder and president or CEO of IDX, um, which is a business located up in Burlington, one of the larger businesses in the state that um, developed um, electronic medical records. Um, so I knew Rich with the work he, he did um, as ID as the president of IDX, um, and you know Howard Dean. We had a, a lot of uh, dealings with him. I also knew Rich because, believe it or not, even though he was a Republican, he was a big supporter of Howard's presidential campaign. He was one of the first um, campaign donors to us, even pre um, the campaign. We had a political action committee first. So I had a um, working relationship with Rich. He called me up and said, um, will you help me out? Will you give me the democratic perspective of um, policy issues in our state? And I thought it was an opportunity to educate somebody work across party lines, which I think is a very important thing in this state. I think it's sort of, um, you know, we're a small enough state that, as you said, we're all going to have to work, each, work with each other at the end, and I really do think that it's important um, to work with everybody. And I think sometimes it's too bad that when somebody does that, they're um, criticized for it, because I think that's what it all comes down to. I think people are sick and tired of what goes on in Congress which is a lot of party politics. And I don't want to ever see that happen in our state. Um, so, you know, I, I am you know, going to work towards that if I'm in the legislature as well. I'm happy to work with Democrats, Independents, Republicans, whatever party you are, I'm happy to um, work together. And in response, Tristan, uh, some of the uh, uh, public statements by others within this campaign regarding 
mm -hmm. uh, Kate's experience have, have, have really kind of turned the corner and gotten a little bit uh, heated and, and maybe over the top. What do you say about such tactics and people who use them? Well, I, I guess I would say first off that um, you know everyone is entitled to their own opinion, and I, I didn't have any influence uh, on that particular uh, issue. I think that I, I, I think I know what you're referring to, and while it is somebody that I am friends with, it's not something that that I have driven. And I think uh, Kate can attest to the fact that she, when she and I have been together in every public statement I've made, I've been very. Uh, um, I think respectful of Kate's experience and, and her as a person, and I think that that's important. And I think Kate has returned that uh, to me uh, throughout the whole process. Uh, I, in terms of the specific issue, you know, I, I I don't necessarily understand the decision, but it wasn't my decision to make. And and I think that there are a lot of other issues that are really much more pressing and, and important for this community. Uh, for us to focus on, and I, and I go back to the choice between us being really about the difference of our life experiences over the last 15 years, and that's how that impacts you know our vision for the community and our ability to be effective for the community. And I think that's what this race is about. We have about five minutes before we uh, wrap this up, and um, I, I think it's only fair for both of you to have the opportunity to make a final pitch to voters that say, "Hey, look." The election is Tuesday. I know you, you've got plenty of choices in your life. Many of them are tough choices. This may be or may not be one of the tougher. Why should I choose you? Tristan, you're first. Well, I think for me, uh, what, I, what I have found as I've been em embarking on this political process uh, for the first time is that um, the issues that I did get really involved with in the, in the community over the last decade or so of, of being a business owner and being working on on local farms and on the future of Vermont agriculture and how that fits into Vermont's rural heritage uh, of being a parent uh, and having two kids in the school system and being an active volunteer in the school system and and also teaching a part-time class there I, I feel that what I have what I'm discovering is how important these issues are for people in the community how they recognize that there's more room for those uh, issues to be carried up in Montpelier by somebody from this local community. Uh, and I feel that I have the passion and the commitment uh, to make a difference. And you know, I'm a thoughtful uh, person. I, I work really hard at learning things that I don't know. Uh, and I, I deeply care about sort of substantive answers to the challenges that we face. And I feel that I am in a position where uh, I will be a strong local advocate for Brattleboro uh, with, with a proven commitment to the community and uh, a plan to be here for a long time making a difference. Kate? Sure. Um, first of all, I do want to say everybody needs to vote, no matter who they're voting for. Um, but I think one of the reasons that I feel that I'm the best person to go up to Montpelier is um, the experience that I've had, not only here in Brattleboro, Again, you know, I grew up um, here, um, and I've been going around knocking on a lot of doors. And I think what people want is somebody who can be a strong advocate for not only Brattleboro, but Wyndham County. There's a lot of realization in this town that um, sometimes people feel like Montpelier doesn't even know that we exist. I have so many people say that to me. So I want to go up, work with the current delegation that we have, work with the governor, and, and be, we are here. Um, we need the help with jobs. We need the um, help with get um, the educational system. And as I said earlier, I spent 11 and a half years up in Montpelier, and I feel like I can hit the ground running and um, be, you know, a strong, strong voice and be an experienced voice um, for our community. And I love Brattleboro. It's played a huge role in not only my life but the right, the life of my parents. So I go up there with passion and the, the push to advocate for anything and everything that we should be getting down here. And a final question for both of you, uh, Kate, Tristan, if the other one gets the nomination on Tuesday, will you support them? Yes. Yes. You know, I really want to say thank you. I mean, I've, I've known both of you, known both of your families for more than three decades in, in, in each cases and uh, known you both to be quality people and I know that the district has a very difficult choice and uh, A, 
thank you for throwing your hat in the ring, getting involved, and B, I hope that whatever happens, the both of you really continue to be active and be involved in this community because we need everybody to be involved. Thank you. Thank you, Tim, and you, uh, you lead, we follow. All I am is a, is a voice, a mouthpiece. Oh, you're a lot more than that. Bless you. I do want to tell you that the Brattleboro Town Clerk's Office is open today until noontime if you would like to vote early. And uh, it really is not called absentee balloting anymore. It's called early voting yeah. because you can vote actually a month before the uh, primary and coming up you'll be able to vote a month before the general election. So the uh, Town Clerk's Office in the Brattleboro Municipal Center is open until noon today and then open 8.30 until 5 tomorrow for early voting. Polling in Brattleboro is from 9 to 7 on Tuesday uh, at Brattleboro Union High School in the gym. We would hope that you all vote, and certainly wherever you are in the state of Vermont, please vote. In fact, you can find out uh, your local polling hours by calling your town clerk's office. I would tell you that I know in Vernon it is 7 to 7, and that only reason I know that is I'm the chair of the Board of Civil Authority in that community, if, 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 if truth be known. Thank you for spending time with us this morning. This is Tim Johnson again. Thanks to our guests, and above all, please vote.